أتيتك يا خالقي باكيا ودمع الأسى كل حين يزيد فقد قلت في الآي لا تقنطوا وإن تعف عني فذا يوم عيد وإن تعف عني الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Inshallah, today we want to look at three different collections of uh, hadith. The first one, we're not going to spend too much time with it because it's not really a collection or meant to be a collection of a hadith. But this is the collection of the Egyptian scholar Abu Ja'far Ahmed ibn Muhammad ibn Salama al-Tahawi, who was born in the year 239 after the Hijrah, and he died in the year 321 after the Hijrah. And many of us may have heard of Imam al-Tahawi if, if we've ever studied the Aqidah or Aqidah al-Tahawiyyah, which is a short treatise affirming the Aqidah of Ahl sunnah wal Jama'a. Now, Imam al-Tahawi, rahmatullahi alayhi, he grew up on the madhab of Imam al-Shafi'i, and this is mainly because his uncle, Ismail ibn Yahya al-Muzani, was one of the great students of Imam al-Shafi'i. In fact, Imam al-Shafi'i, Shafi'i rahmatullahi alayhi said, he said, Al-Muzaniyu Nasiru Madhabi, that Al-Muzani is the helper or the supporter of my madhab. And at tahawi he didn't remain on the Shafi'i madhab though. As he grew older and he traveled, he took a liking to the madhab of Imam Abu Hanifa, and this became his madhab, although he practiced it without the asub, meaning he uh, didn't uh, firmly hold on to whatever was said in the madhab. If he found something to be closer to the truth, then he followed that instead, even if it was outside of the madhab. And this is clear from his works. If anyone were to study his works, they would find that this was quite clear uh, in his methodology, when especially when uh, coming or deriving at fiqh opinion. And he didn't travel as as far as some of the other scholars we looked at before, limiting his journey uh, his journeys mainly to the region of Asham before returning to Egypt. But he had the opportunity to learn from Imam al Nasai. When Imam al Nasai came to Egypt, he had an opportunity to sit with him and learn with him. So, although many consider Imam al Tahawi being a scholar of fiqh, we're mentioning here, him here because without a doubt he is a scholar of hadith and quite knowledgeable in the ilal uh, of a hadith, meaning the defects of a hadith. Now, two of his main works are Sharh Ma'ani al Athar and Sharh Mushkil al Athar. And these are extremely beneficial works to the students of hadith and to the scholars of hadith. Um, especially uh, when it comes to Imam al-Tahawi mentioning defects or what he found to be defects in the hadith. He's quite strong in these, uh, in these points. And so both of these are extremely important collections for students of knowledge and even for scholars to, um, uh, to know and, and, and look at these uh, works of Imam al-Tahawi. The next collection we want to look at is that of Abu Hatim, Muhammad ibn Hibban al-Busti, who was born in the year 270 after the Hijra in the historical city of Bust. And Bust today is called Lashkarga, which is in uh, southwest Afghanistan. And we don't know when Ibn Hibban first began learning, but Dhahabi rahmatullah mentions that he it was around the year 300 after the Hijra. Uh, and this could be when he began to take knowledge seriously and really dedicate his time to learning. And uh, Ibn Hibban rahmatullah alayhi, uh, he traveled to more than 40 cities um, collecting a hadith and studying from the scholars, including the regions the regions that were first near him, such as Sijistan and Bukhara and Nisabur, and then venturing west to Baghdad and Basra, Kufa, Mosul, Raqqa, Hims, Dimashq, Beirut, Ramla, Beit al-Maqdis, and even Egypt, where he heard from Imam, Imam al-Nasai there. In fact, Ibn Hibban himself mentions that he took from about or uh, probably more than 2,000 scholars or shiuch. And amongst the shiuch, he learned from one of the most, uh, one of the ones he relied on the most in his collections uh, we'll be speaking about, uh, or the collection we're going to be speaking about, is Abu Ya'la al-Musli, who we spoke about two lessons ago. He narrated from Abu Ya'la 1,174 ahadith in this specific collection. But the sheikh that he was most influ influenced by was Ibn Khuzayma. And uh, he narrated, he, even though he didn't narrate as many ahadith from Ibn Khuzayma, he was quite influenced by him. He narrated 301 ahadith in the collection that we're going to be speaking about. And as for his students, then the most notable of them includes uh, Abu Abdullah Muhammad ibn Abdullah al-Hakim al Naysaburi, who we're going to speak about in our next lesson, inshallah, and also a Dar uh, Ali ibn Umar al Dar and we're going to speak about him in our next lesson as well, inshallah. And uh, as well as Muhammad ibn Ishaq ibn Yahya, 
Ibn Manda al-Asbahani, and he is the author of a number of works, including Ma'rifat al-Sahaba and uh, Al-Tawheed, Al-Kuna, and other works. So these are all great scholars of hadith, and they were students of Ibn Hibban. Now, unfortunately, Ibn Hibban, he was influenced by the people of Kalam, and the people of Kalam are those who tried to rationalize the religion uh, using their intellects, meaning if something didn't sit well with their intellects, then they then they used, uh, or if, if a text didn't sit well with their intellects, then they used their intellects to justify what the position in the deen should be. And many of the deviant sects fall under this category, such as, uh, as uh, Mu'tazila and the Jahmiya and others, they fall under the sect uh, or of those who we call the people of Kalam. And Ibn Hibban, unfortunately, was influenced by this uh, school, um, being that he um, had a chance or he dabbled in philosophy and other things, but uh, he used his intellect, uh, his aql, uh, to affirm matters in the deen. So, for example, he rejected any of the hadith that spoke about the Prophet ﷺ tying stones around his stomach because of hunger, and he called these texts all uh, false or fabrications, saying, Allahu yut'imu rasula wa ma yughni al-hajar min al that it is Allah that feeds his messenger, what is a stone going to do when it comes to hunger? Um, so this is unfortunately uh, one of the uh, mistakes that Ibn Hibban fell into. And it is this philosophical influence that also got him into trouble a little bit. When he was in Naysabur, a man asked him about what Nubuwa was, what prophethood was. And Ibn Hibban replied, he said, Nubuwa al-ilmu wal-amal, that uh, prophethood is knowledge and action. And when the people heard this, they accused him of being a zindiq or, or someone who tries to destroy the religion from inside, uh, even demanding that he be killed. And news of this spread to the uh, Abbasid Khalifa at the time, and the Abbasid Khalifa uh, told them to investigate the matter. And if they found that what Ibn Hibban said was true, then he was to be killed. But if not, then he was to be spared. And Ibn Hibban was able to get his way out of it. And al Dhabi rahmatullahi alayhi, um, he tried to um, uh, soften, I guess, basically what Ibn Hibban uh, saying or, or defend his position saying that the people of Ahlul Sunnah, if they were to use a statement like that, that prophethood is actions uh, or knowledge and actions, and what's meant by it is that it means kamal uh, al-ilm wal-amal, that it is the complete embodiment or uh, perfection of knowledge and action, whereas the people of Kalam, then they would say that Prophethood is something that's earned. So if someone reaches a high level of knowledge and a high level of actions, then they become prophets. So this is what the people of, uh, uh, of Egypt accused Ibn Hibban of saying, and for this reason they kicked him out. So even though he was able to uh, free himself or spare himself from being killed, the people of Egypt um, wouldn't tolerate him being there anymore, and they kicked him out, and Ibn Hibban went to Nezapur. And, uh, um, uh, sorry, this was in... Uh, Nisabur uh, that this happened and then from there he went to Sijistan and in Sijistan Ibn Hibban fell also into some hot water um, when he was asked or he denied rather that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had a head and this is a, a lengthy topic in Aqidah um, and it really depends the understanding of it really depends on what's meant by head so what does a person mean when they when they say head so uh, does someone mean by it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, is uh, separate from his creation, these are some of the. This is one of the meanings that's implied by it. In any case, Ibn Hibban denied that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala had a head, and the people of Sijistan at the time they affirmed that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala had a head, and because of this, they uh, became pretty upset with him, and they kicked him out of Sijistan. And from there, Ibn Hibban went to Bustan. It is there that he reigned until he died. Now, as for the works of Ibn Hibban, then he has a number of important collections that uh, we should mention, and the first is one called Kitab al thuqat and uh, another one called Ma'rifatul Majruheen Min al Muhaddithin wal Du'afa wal Matrukin. Um, so the first book, uh, Kitab al Thuqat, actually, both of these books, they're abridged, work, uh, abridged books from Ibn Hibban's At uh, Tariq al Kabir. And the first book, Kitab al Thuqat, then this is a book where Ibn Hibban lists those who he considered permissible to rely on when it comes to narrations. And he mentioned conditions that they had to be free from in order to be relied upon. And this is a book, unfortunately, that needs uh, to be understood properly because some people um, assume that just because Ibn Hibban 
put a uh, mention a person in that book by name without mentioning anything else about him or maybe just mentioning some historical facts about him then this person can be relied upon because Ibn Hibban I guess uh, um, affirmed that this person is someone his narrations can be relied upon the issue is Ibn Hibban had a methodology in um, in what's called I, I guess the endorsement of a person that wasn't really the methodology of the scholars of before and basically what he understood was that if a person if there was no jarh against a person meaning no criticism against the person and uh, also no endorsement against a per, uh, for that person if there's nothing either way then we would accept that narrator because why would we assume that a person is bad but the scholars of hadith uh, from before they understood this quite differently and in fact if we don't know who a person is then we can't accept their narrations because they could be liars and they could be people who um uh, who were not trustworthy or people who had issues in their deen. So why we have to know who we're taking our religion from. And these, this is, uh, these are statements of scholars that we heard before. Um, you know, such as, uh, the statement this, that this knowledge is our religion. So look to who you take your religion from. You have to know who it is that you're taking your deen from. So Ibn Hibban had a little bit of a different take on this. And he was followed, uh, in this by his student Al Hakim as well, who we're going to speak about in our next lesson as well, inshallah. But, uh, so in any case, uh, Kitab al Thuqa, what we should mention about this is that just because Ibn Hubban mentions a person in there, it doesn't mean that we can rely on that person. But if he mentions a person in there and he says that this person is thiqa, that this person is reliable, this person is trustworthy, then absolutely we take what he says because his uh, commentary and criticism is uh, is highly acceptable. Um, as for his other book, Ma'rifat al-Majruheen, then this is uh, a book that basically means knowing those who are criticized from uh, uh, those who are found in the in a hadith. Uh, from those who are weak and those who are abandoned. And this is an important collection as well for analyzing a hadith. And the words, as I mentioned, of Ibn Hibban are, uh, are to be relied upon heavily when it comes to the understanding of the men and criticism of a person. Um, so this is a book where he mentions many of those who are weak and many of those who are abandoned. Now, as for the collection we're concerned with, then the original title of it is called Al-Musnad al-Sahih. على التقاسيم والأنواع من غير وجود قطع في 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 سندها ولا ثبوت جرح في ناقليها. So uh, this, uh, um, I guess uh, the translation of this would be the Sahih Musnad according to, vid, to divisions and varieties without the presence of any disconnect in the chain nor an established criticism against its transmitters. And for short, uh, many many of the scholars afterwards simply refer to it as At-Taqasim wal anwa And before uh, and then afterwards it became known as Sahih Ibn Hibban and many of us know it by this name and this is mainly because whatever Ibn Hibban entered in this collection then to him he considered this to be sahih uh, at least according to him and there are a total of 7495 hadith in sahih ibn hibban and the best of what can be said about it is that uh, there's a good portion of a hadith uh, in this book, uh, you know, almost three quarters of the hadith of the hadith in this book. They do happen to follow the uh, conditions of Imam al-Bukhari and Muslim of either one of them or sometimes both of them. And in fact, even many of these hadith we will find in the Sahihain, in the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari, either uh, in one of them or in both of them. But the, uh, unfortunately, one... Uh, uh, one quarter, at least a quarter of this book, um, so some scholars say about 2,500 hadith in this collection fall outside of the conditions of al-Bukhari and Muslim. And these hadith, mainly these hadith that are outside these, uh, they follow different, as we mentioned, uh, a me methodology of authenticating a hadith that's not based on the uh, established scholars from before, the scholars who are to be considered when it comes to uh, understanding men and criticizing and endorsing men. And these narrations, many of them are weak narrations and um, or either contain someone in the chain that's weak or they have other defects to them. Them. Um, so these narrations cannot be accepted. Uh, Ibn Hibban, he died in the year 354 after the Hijrah. But again, Sahih Ibn Hibban is one of the major collections of a hadith. And the scholars differ uh, where, it, where it falls when it comes to the, um, the order of authentic books. Uh, some put it before the Sahih of Ibn Khuzayma, but this seems to be 
um, not a very strong opinion, Sahih ibn Khuzayma would actually come before Sahih, the Sahih of ibn Hibban. Wallahu alam. And the next collection we want to speak about is the collection of Abu al-Qasim, Sulaiman ibn Ahmed al-Tabarani, who was born in the year 260 after the Hijra, born in the year 260 after the Hijra in the city of Akka, which is in the occupied region of Palestine. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala free it. Uh, now, Al-Dhahabi mentions that he began listening very early to the scholars, beginning at the age of 13 with the shuyukh of his area, and at the age of 15, his father began to travel with him, supervising his um, his, uh, his studies and taking him from place to place to meet with the shuyukh of the different uh, areas and writing from over 1,000 of them. And although some of the main muhaddithin uh, we spoke about in our previous lessons had already passed away, Imam Al-Tabarani, rahmatullahi alayhi, he had the ability or the opportunity rather to learn from the students of some of these great scholars of hadith so for example he learned from the or studied from the students of ibn Juraj and uh, Shu'ab ibn al-Hajjaj and Sufyan al-Thawri and the students of Imam Malik and the students of Imam Abu Dawood al-Tayarisi and the students of Abdul Razak and others so he didn't get to meet these imams themselves but he met their students and took knowledge from them and he was also a student of uh, Abdullah ibn Ahmed ibn Hanbal the son of uh, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal he narrated a great deal from him in his collections and as we mentioned uh, previously as well he was a student of the Imam al-Nasai and Ibn al-Jarud and Abu Ya'la al-Musali and Abu Awana so he had the opportunity to also meet some some of these great authors themselves of books of hadith a hadith and collections of a hadith and uh, as for his students, they include Ibn Manda, who we previously mentioned as also being a student of Ibn Hibban, and Abu Naim al-Asbahani, who is Ahmed ibn Abdullah ibn Ahmed ibn Ushaq, and he is also an author of a number of collections of a hadith, uh, 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 for example, Dala al nubuwa The Proofs of Prophethood, and he also has a book, Ma'rifat al-Sahaba. Um, so he's a, he's a well-known author as well um, when it comes to collecting, um, speaking mainly about these books, speak mainly about um, the history of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the history of the Sahaba, getting to know the Sahaba or hadith about the virtues of the Sahaba. So this is we'll find these in, in this uh, in these specific works. As for his collection, then Imam Al Tabarani was known to author a number of collections, so not just one, um, especially because he lived over 100 years, just over 100 years. And we know that Al Tabarani authored a collection of tafsir, but the uh, two collections that some people attribute to being the tafsir of Imam al-Tabarani today, one called the tafsir al-Kabir and the other one called the tafsir al-Quran al-Azim. Both of them are being are attributed to being the works of Imam al-Tabarani, rahmatullahi alayhi, but Allah ta'ala, the most correct opinion is that these are the works of someone else and not, uh, and not his collection of tafsir that uh, we know he authored, but so his actual collection still seems to be missing, wallahu alam. But he has a number of collections that have been published and are available to us today. One of them is called Musnad al-Shamiyin. And this collection, Imam al-Tabarani, he reported uh, a hadith um, or he collected the hadith reported by the narrators of Asham. And although he collected ma many narrators in this, he was criticized for not including some of the main narrators of Asham. Uh, for some reason, they were left out from his work, such as uh, Imam al Ozai and Abu Duris al Khawlani and Khalid ibn Ma'dan uh, and others. And it is a Musnad that, it's not a very lengthy Musnad, but it's a Musnad that uh, contains 89 narrators. And the Tabarani was also known for collecting um, a hadith that were uh, length, lengthy hadith and his book was actually called Al-Hadith Al-Tiwal, the lengthy uh, narrations. And um, many of them had to do with the Islam of some of the Sahaba, like how they came to Islam and uh, some of the narrations concerning them and also narrations from some of the Tabi'een. And although there's only 99 narrations in this book, we will find that a good portion of them are weak and some uh, very weak and, uh, and even a few fabricated hadith in this. So it's not a large collection, but we can see that it's not a very reliable collection either. And another well-known collection is also called uh, Kitab al-Dua. And this is a collection where Imam al-Tabarani, rahmatullahi alayhi, he gathered the hadith having to do with uh, ad'iyah, uh, different supplications in different athkar to be said at different times. And in this, he collected 2,251 hadith. And again, we'll find that many of them are weak or very weak hadith. Now, the main collections that we wanted to speak about for Imam al-Tabarani, we refer to them as al-ma'ajim. And a mu'jam is a collection where the author, he... Uh, compiles the hadith or he compiles it based 
on alphabetical order. So depending on who, um, uh, on who he's uh, uh, sorting the book by, he arranges it in alphabetical order. And he has three main collections, Al-Mu'jam Al-Saghir, Al-Mu'jam Al-Awsat, and Al-Mu'jam Al-Kabir. And these collections basically fall under the category of a Musnad. So what he's doing is he's gathering the Ahadith based on a narrator, depending on where that narrator is in the chain. So... Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> so he'll have he'll have a specific narrator and he'll gather all the ahadith that he wanted to include under that narrator narrator before he moves on to another narrator and this is what we've referred to or discussed before as being a musnad but what makes it a mu'jam is now he uh, organizes it in alphabetical order so al mu'jam al saghir is a collection where tabarani lists his shiyukh so the shiyukh that he narrated from and he arranges them like his shiyukh meaning uh, the sheikh that Imam al-Tabarani heard from, he lists them in alphabetical order, and this is what we find in al-Mu'jam al-Saghir. And after he mentions the sheikh, he'll usually include one hadith, for the most part it's only one hadith of that sheikh, so he mentioned the sheikh and the chain to that hadith and include that one hadith, and in some cases he included uh, two hadith. And al-Mu'jam al-Awsat is a collection where al-Tabarani also lists his shiyukh, but he mentions narrations that we call um, uh, uh, have a quality of what we call uh, tafarrud in it, meaning that somewhere along the line in that chain, only one narrator narrated this hadith from his sheikh and nobody else narrated that hadith from the sheikh. So it's still a collection based on his shiyukh, uh, arranged in alphabetical order, meaning the shiyukh of Imam al-Tabrani, um, arranged in alphabetical order, but in this particular case, he included one hadith for that sheikh and somewhere along the line, uh, we say that uh, tafarrud took place with this hadith or he considered tafarrud had taken place with this hadith because only one narrator narrated it from his sheikh somewhere in that chain and nobody else narrated it as well. And the significance of this collection, the last collection maybe one might not find to be very uh, significant or valuable, but the significance of this one here is that um, uh, this could lead to uh, an understanding of the change and also leads to maybe why a specific narration might be defective because a person was alone in narrating it when others who were more likely to or should have narrated didn't narrate this hadith. So this is a collection where we can understand um, the criticism of Imam al-Tabarani or the commentary of Imam al-Tabarani on this hadith. Um, they have to be understood more or studied more. And the last collection of his is Al-Mu'jam al-Kabir. And then Mu'jam al-Kabir is actually uh, the, if we wanted to look at all three of these ma'ajim, then this is probably the most valuable of them because it's similar to the Muslim of Imam Ahmed and others where uh, Al-Tabarani, he collected the ahadith of the Sahaba. So all the Sahaba that he uh, included in this collection, uh, he arranged them in alphabetical order. So different than some of the other Musnads, this one actually, uh, he arranged the Sahaba according to alphabetical order, and this is what makes it a Mu'jim, but a Musnad in the sense that he took all the hadith of Abu Bakr and he put it, and then he followed it by the hadith of Umar ibn Khattab and, 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 uh, and included it in there. And the only thing that he did differently here, or what takes it outside of the Mu'jim a little bit, is that he began with the uh, 10 given glasses tidings of paradise al-ashar al-mubashirin bil-jannah these uh, these 10 he began with them and then after that he included the other sahaba according to uh, arranged it according to uh, uh, an alphabetical order and the only thing that was uh, uh, and some criticize him for it, but he didn't include the Musnad of Abu Huraira within this collection, but he did single out that collection. So he has uh, a separate Musnad called Musnad Abi Huraira, um, where he included the hadith that he collected from Abu Huraira or his uh, his chains to the hadith of Abu Huraira, but he left it outside of this Mu'jam al-Kabir. But this is, again, a very valuable collection, uh, especially if one is looking for a hadith having uh, to come from a particular Sahabi. But... Uh, because it is uh, a later collection, uh, we will find that there are a number of weak hadith and a number of very weak hadith and even a, a number of fabricated hadith within this collection. And actually the Mu'jim uh, of uh, Al-Mu'jim Al-Kabir, uh, the current publication we have is actually 25 volumes, but volumes 13 to 16 are missing. 
And despite this, there's about 25,000, uh, over 25,000 hadith in this collection. But, um, and the scholars say that if we probably had the other collections like uh, volume 13, 14, 15, and 16, if we did have these, then it would most likely reach over 30,000 hadith at Tabarani included in this. And uh, as for Tabarani himself, then he died in the year 360 after the Hijrah, as we mentioned, living to be over 100 years in age. والله تعالى أعلم. With this, inshallah, we'll stop. والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته.